Peter de Bolla, Professor of Cultural History and Aesthetics in this university. Many discussions about the value of the humanities rest upon a fundamental distinction between the arts and the sciences that I do not accept. I do not mean to claim by this that the practices of knowledge production, curation or dissemination are identical in those domains of a human inquiry we commonly label the arts and sciences. Nor do I want to be understood as saying that all the sciences share common aims, principles or methods of inquiry, still less that the arts or humanities are an undifferentiated set of practices. Rather, I wish to remind us that the division of the faculties, as the Enlightenment termed it, rested upon the assumption that knowledge and its necessary interrogation is a human good. Whatever we know, however and wherever we seek out knowledge, we do so as human agents, as minds seeking to find order where there is chaos, reason and rule where there is apparent confusion, explanation where there is superstition. At first glance, this might be taken to be a description of what is distinctive in or to the humanities. It is the human agent who knows. Yet in fact, the peculiar and distinctive feature of the Enlightenment's conception of human inquiry is the thought that non-human ways of knowing are possible and susceptible of inquiry. The Enlightenment invention of aesthetics, for example, asks us to consider the notion that the artwork knows, or more precisely, that the artwork is a way of knowing. In a similar vein, it proposes the hypothesis that history, by which I mean historical knowledge, is a way of knowing. Far from imagining a future in which a division appears to separate the sciences from the humanities, the Enlightenment proposes a future science of human understanding that holds in tension what is knowable to the human agent with what is known in and to the world. And that tensile relationship is created by conceiving of different kinds of knowledge, say, the differences between knowing a fact and knowing a motive for a particular form of behavior. Let's call it knowing that and knowing by. On this account, the humanities, far from being the counterweight to, to science, are precisely the terrain upon which any attempt to construct coherence or sense from the chaos of the world becomes possible. That terrain is precisely the locale in which scientific and non-scientific ways of knowing interact, reflect upon and interfere with each other, contrast and corroborate what we know from within the human agent and from without, where the knowing of history or the world comes up close with the knowledge I discover through scientific inquiry. Where that inquiry into the world fully realizes its humanity, precisely because it entertains the possibility of the knowing of the non-human, that is where the distinctiveness and difficulty of our being human is confronted. I don't mean this to suggest that humanism or the humanities should, after all, be considered to be sovereign in respect to what we can know. I'm not trying to simply collapse science under the weight of an all-embracing humanism. Rather, I'm trying to hold in our minds the thought that these different forms of knowledge and knowing spring from a common root. You can see that commonality in the fact that the values that are upheld in the sciences, the testing of evidence, citation of scholarship, accuracy, rigorous application of method or principle, are also upheld in the humanities. Equally, values that are disparaged and discouraged in the humanities unverifiable assertion, partial or unduly skewed use of evidence, poor or incoherent argumentation, are disparaged in the sciences. Both generate and use hypotheses, theories and general accounts of the materials they study and investigate. Both test these hypotheses and theories by placing them into tension with specific empirical evidence. But it is equally important to register the differences between the sciences and the non-sciences as they have evolved in the contemporary regimes of knowledge production. The sciences can easily be shown to lead to improving our human predicament in all manner of ways. It is abundantly clear, for example, that human well-being and health are directly connected to advances in medical science. But perhaps it is less often remarked that such human well-being also depends upon narratives of the good life of sociality and responsibility for our actions and words that are found in fictions and philosophies, histories and paintings. Even more importantly, 
a certain freedom for exploring and experimenting with imagined alternatives to the narratives we inherit is a central feature of what in general we think of as the humanities. This is to note that our well-being also depends on our exploring and imagining possible ways of being with each other and ourselves and of testing these imagined habits of being. Furthermore, the enormous benefit to human life that can be generated by scientific and technological advances does not come without potential cost. Two examples will make my point. Advances in the life and medical sciences improve human health, but they also have had the effect of prolonging lifespans. Such prolong prolongation of life has real and direct consequences in respect to our ability to sustain comfortable and improving conditions for living consequences that are moral, economic, political, social, legal, and cultural, and are best explored in tandem with experts whose homes are found in faculties of law, economics, <coughs> philosophy, and politics. It is for this reason, of course, that research into genetics now routinely joins common cause with ethics. And we should pause to note that this is a two-way street. Advances in genetics push our thinking in the domain of ethics into new shapes and forms. In my second example, advances in communications technology have far outstripped our thinking with regard to the ethical, political, and cultural consequences of these changes. It is as if an ideology of pure technological innovation and advancement is being applied without due concern for thinking through possible consequences of such advancement. Facebook is an intervention, trivial or not as you like, into human sociality, a domain that is inconceivable out with ethical, political, cultural and religious desiderata. In both these cases, one can immediately see that science and technology need to be connected to the kinds of thinking that take place in the humanities and social sciences. We join these things together on the terrain of the human since this is the common rootstock for all of our attempts to understand the world and know ourselves. If we stand anywhere else, we caught the danger of only knowing that and no longer knowing by. <laughs>